Welcome back, chemists. Last time we looked at using Newman projections to explain low energy conformations for hydrocarbons. Today we're going to use that again, but this time look at rings, cyclic compounds. Starting with the smallest of three membered ring, there's a cyclopropane skeleton. Let's clean it up a little bit and add hydrogens and take a look at a Newman projection. You can tell that there's no way for this to exist any other way other than those three carbons are in one plane. Cyclopropane is a flat and very strange molecule. And one reason is that those Newman projections are all perfectly eclipsed. If we try a four-membered ring, let's change it just a little bit and add a carbon. Now you get to still a fairly flat molecule. In fact, this one looks perfectly flat with all eclipsed interactions. But there's a slight puckering that's possible once you get to a fourth atom in the ring. And even more so when you get to five carbons, here comes a cyclo pentane ring, and now when I look at this one, I can tell that's much less planar than before. I can certainly find a Newman projection like that one on the left that looks very eclipsed, but if I rotate around and look at that one all the way to the right, uh, that looks much more staggered. So cyclopentane, because it can, it can pucker out of that plane, has the opportunity for some of its bonds to exist with staggered interactions. And then the story gets even better when you get to a six-membered ring. So let's look at a six-membered ring. This is a cyclohexane. And then I get to a confirmation, which luckily this simulator just gave me on the spot, where no matter which two consecutive carbons I look at as I rotate around, every single Newman projection shows a perfectly staggered confirmation. Cyclohexane has no ring strain as a result, and six-membered rings are very stable because of this feature. So let's write down a couple of things related to that starting with the Newman projections that we saw in a three-membered ring. So there's our skeletal Newman projection. Remember, circle in the back. Uh, a circle means the carbon in the back, and a dot means a carbon in the front. And if I fill in my three bonds on the front, a Newman perspective would have H, H, and then carbon. But that carbon is attached to the carbon in the back. So I can just draw it with a line, like so. And there I can see the very eclipse and thus strained conformations for a cyclopropane, all eclipsed, meaning all the bonds coming off of the carbons in the front and the back have to be eclipsed. Cyclobutane isn't too much better. Let's start with a Newman template. However, I can pucker it just a little bit so you can actually get a confirmation that's a little bit better than being perfectly eclipsed. You can get what looks like a skewed confirmation. It's still highly strained, but not as bad as a cyclopropane ring in terms of the eclipsing interactions. The picture got much better with a cyclopentane ring. Now you actually have the possibility of at least one confirmation that looks perfectly staggered. If you make a model of this, you'll be able to see that that's true. Some staggered. However, also some eclipsed. We couldn't get everything. But then once we get to a six-membered ring, that became our best case scenario, and you could get everything to be in a staggered confirmation. And here's one way I could show that. There's my three atoms off of the front, three atoms off the back, staggered, H, H, and then these are two carbons that are just connected to the rest of the ring, let's say that. In fact, you could actually draw sort of a double Newman projection, and I'll show that down here. So here is a double Newman projection side by side that chemists sometimes use to show this when they're imagining seeing two Newmans for the price of one. In fact, let's go back to that animation. Here is the confirmation we're talking about. There's one perspective right there. If you look at the carbon pair on the right and the carbon pair on the left, you sort of see two Newmans at the same time and they're both showing a staggered arrangement, almost a perfectly staggered arrangement. So I'll try to show that with what I see here. I see an H, an H, and a carbon on that leftmost carbon on the front, and then an H, an H, and then another carbon off of the back. And then what's on the right Newman projection? Well, I've got an H, an H, and then connected to the rest of the ring like so, and then the carbon in the back has an H, an H, and then connected to that same 
carbon. So you just get a nice, we'll call it double Newman projection. This is actually called a chair conformation. And that's simply because if you look at the three-dimensional shape of this, it sort of resembles a, a chaise lounge, if you will. There's a cartoon down here that shows someone lounging on one of those chairs, and that's a cyclohexane ring, if you think about it. That's not the only confirmation that a cyclohexane ring can exist in. It's the most stable one. There's another one, which they aptly call a boat confirmation. And remember, a conformational isomer is what you get if you have just a rotation about a single carbon-carbon bond. Now, in a six-membered ring like this, we can't rotate all the way around a bond, but you can have partial rotation, as that animation is showing you right now, where it puckers in different ways, and you do get a number of different conformations that exist. In fact, this is looping back and forth between two slightly different chair conformations. We'll get back to that in our next video. But along the way, you get to others that just have names, things like a boat or a twist boat and a twist chair. There's lots of names for these different conformations. We're just going to focus on what we're going to call the chair, and the boat conformation, and chairs are much more stable than boat conformations. Here are representations of those two, and we can use Newman projections to explain that as well. So I'm gonna draw a Newman projection of what I would see for a boat conformation. Here's my starting point. I've got three bonds coming off of the carbon in the front, H, H, and then carbon that's part of the ring, and then three carbons off, uh, three bonds off the carbon in the back, H, H and other carbon that's part of the ring. But wait, this is not going to be staggered. If it's in a boat, what you'll find is that this perspective, or these two perspectives side by side, are actually all eclipsed. So I have a Newman projection that looks like that. And then I have a second Newman side by side that I can connect with the first. And then you can see one reason why boats are so much less stable. All eclipsed. So the bottom line, boats are less stable than chairs. And yes, we do use these terms for everyday household objects to refer to confirmations of cyclohexane rings. Even if they're not cyclohexane, could have a heteroatom in the ring somewhere, like an oxygen or a nitrogen, you can still talk about its chair confirmation or its boat confirmation. Lastly for today, we're going to look, look at a lot of chairs as we move forward, uh, and they're going to be substituted. This applies to things other than just cyclohexane rings with all hydrogens attached. What happens if we put in a substituent on that ring? Well, there's two different terms we use to describe those substituents, respectively axial and equatorial. The axial substituents, let me go back to one of our models here. Here's a chair. The axial substituents are the ones that are all parallel to each other. So look at that model in front of you. Look at just the hydrogens, or the CH bonds more particularly. And notice there are six of them that are all perfectly parallel to each other. There's three pointing straight up, and there's three pointing straight down. And we call those axial substituents. The others that are sort of around the perimeter of the ring pointing more outwardly, outside the ring, those we call the equatorial substituents. In fact, if I zoom this to a different perspective and look at it from one face, you sort of only see the equatorial bonds coming out of the ring. None of those are in the same plane, though. They're all uh, askew to each other, as opposed to the axials all being uh, parallel to one another. So the axial substituents are those six bonds right there, and the equatorial substituents are those six right there. And we will practice drawing these a lot as we move forward in this unit. And here's just a chair with all six of them. Little tip if you're starting to draw these, how to draw a chair uh, is it's three sets of parallel lines. And I can just highlight the one that's right here. There's one set that's parallel to each other. There's a second set that's parallel to each other. And then there's a third set that's parallel to each other. And if I had to fill in the axial bonds, each part of the chair that looks like a corner right there actually points toward where the axial bond is. So let's say this corner in the upper left, uh, that looks like it's pointing more up as opposed to down. So that means my axial bond is straight up on that carbon. 
Likewise, the one that's already filled in over here, I see this corner looks kind of like an arrowhead. It's pointing more down than up. So that is a down axial substituent. In other words, it makes no sense to draw an axial substituent perfectly vertical like that going down off of that carbon. That's not where it actually is. It's going up. What's down at that position is an equatorial bond. We'll practice that a lot. This is just an introduction to filling in the axial and equatorials. I want to stick to looking at Newman projections for today. So let's draw a Newman projection for this particular methylcyclohexane derivative. And I am going to look at this Newman along, uh, let's see, these two pairs of carbon-carbon bonds. So I'll draw my Newman template, and I see two of them side by side. So I have on the carbon on the left, I have H, H, and then carbon connected to the other one, and then I have an H and a methyl pointing straight down. That's that methyl right there. Everything else is an H or it's the rest of the ring. Now let me compare that with the analogous case that I have off to the right. Here is not an axial methyl, but what we call an equatorial methyl. And I'm going to look at the same exact Newman projection, same perspective, along these two lines. To make my life easier, I'm actually going to copy this one on the left and use it on the right and simply modify it. So what's different about this one well, this methyl isn't here, it's actually up here. I'll make it a different color, just to highlight it. If you can't see that right away, let's zoom in on that chair. Remember, this is still a line structure without the hydrogens actually drawn in, but you can draw them in. There's your methyl, there's your H, there's over here another H, there's another axial H, and then I have other H's back here and other H's back there. So those are all the H's that I'm drawing in, in there, specifically with the methyl, that's what I'm looking at, right there, as opposed to down here. Which of these is better and why? Well, let's think about what we know about Newman projections, and let's just zoom in on the right half of this cyclohexane Newman. There is, even though a staggered confirmation, an unfavorable interaction between this methyl and this carbon, this methylene that's coming off of the back carbon, but they're right next to each other. This is called a Gauche interaction. And we don't have that in the one on the right. These look more anti to each other. So this is more stable. That's one argument. Another reason that's almost the same type of thing has to do with why the axial substituent is uh, less stable. Let me zoom in on that picture just in the chair confirmation, and I'm going to draw a couple of extra bonds right on top of it. Actually, I'll draw it as a fresh chair to teach you a little bit about how to draw chairs. Chairs are three pairs of parallel lines. One set of parallel lines, second set, parallel lines, and a third set of parallel lines. Usually the convention is that none of them are actually parallel to the edge of your paper. If you want to fill in an axial substituent, that's usually a bond that's parallel to the edge of your paper. Here is your methyl, and I'm going to go ahead and fill in the other axial substituents that I have in this chair to highlight something. Remember we said a moment ago, every corner can be thought of as an arrowhead, and it's sort of pointing to where an axial bond is. So if I go to this corner in the upper right, that certainly looks like it's pointing more up. So axial at that position is straight up, and that's just a hydrogen. If I go to the next corner, that looks more like an arrowhead down. So that would be a down hydrogen sort of in the back. By the way, the convention is that the way these chairs are drawn is that the three lines in the lower part are closer to you. You're, you're taking a hexagon ring and you're looking at it along its edge and the part that's lower is meant to be closer to you. So you're actually looking at it a little bit from the top as opposed to from underneath. Uh, anyway, back to these axials. What about this corner right there? Well, that's an arrowhead pointing 
more up than down. So I have an axial up hydrogen. The next corner right here looks more like an arrow down. So I have an axial down hydrogen. And the last one to do would be that corner, which certainly looks more like an arrowhead up. So that's an H pointing straight up. Those are just the axial substituents. And what you have is an unfavorable interaction between the hydrogens and the methyl groups that are separated by three carbons of the ring. So this is called a 1-3, one, 1-2-3 three, one, three diaxial interaction. So 1-3 diaxial interaction. And that's a bad thing. We don't have that in the equatorially substituted cyclohexane ring. Here, if I fill in the rest of the axial bonds, which I can do, they're analogous to the one we just saw. Here, everything is axial. Uh, everything that's axial is a hydrogen. So I do have one three diaxial interactions, but they're all hydrogen, minimal. One three diaxial interactions. So all of that is to say that equatorial substituents are more stable than axial substituents. Equatorial is preferred if possible. And then we're going to come back to what we do if we have multiple groups on a ring. What do we do if we have multiple things? Maybe they can't all be axial. We'll see that as we look at more examples. So to summarize, molecules that exist in rings are really stable if the ring is up to like a six-membered ring. Five-membered rings are pretty good, but six is the best because you can get an all-staggered confirmation, all staggered. Uh, chairs are better than boats, and equatorial is better than axial when you have a single substituent on a chair.